I'm limping a little bit. The, uh, I, I've had a bone spur, and they've been dealing with it for three weeks. Uh, I've, I've traveled through five states with that, wearing a boot, and then uh, so I had to go back today in hopes that maybe they're going to do something to help get rid of it. But basically, they gave me a shot of steroids right in my calf muscle. And so now my calf muscle hurts more than my heel does. <laughs> Where they put that in there, but anyway, that's just that's one of those adjustments. I found out when you start the aging process, there are a series of adjustments that must be made, and the older you get, the closer the adjustments are that you make. And so, because some things just doesn't change, you just have to adjust to them and keep on going. And and that's kind of the way it's been for me here. Uh, I. I uh, Two months ago, I lost some hearing in my left ear, and I'd already lost it in the right ear. And you know what? Thank the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord right now. During this week, it's actually probably been better than the whole three weeks I was traveling and going all those different places. I mean, there was times that I couldn't even hear the pastor speaking from the pulpit, and I'd be sitting down there and have trouble. I could hear him. But the problem with my hearing is understanding. It's just all muddled and everything a lot of times. And so this week I've not had that problem. So praise the Lord. I, I, I just uh, I thank the Lord for it. But I, I usually start out, and I didn't do it this week, but if, if, you, if you say something to me and, and I don't respond, it may be I didn't hear you. I said that when I first started having the problems, and a lady came to me afterwards, and she said, Brother Decker, I'm sure glad you explained that because I was upset at you. I walked behind you this morning and spoke to you, and you never acknowledged me and never said a word. But she said, I'm not mad at you anymore now. So anyway, <laughs> so I, I, was, I was glad of that. <laughs> so, uh, well, take your Bibles tonight. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings and chapter number 4. And uh, we're going to look here at, at several different passages of Scripture. So, so keep your Bibles handy there. You know what? Uh, I've always reminded uh, of a preacher uh, that one day his wife was gone and he got to looking for something and he couldn't find it. And so he got into her closet. And when he got into her closet, he found a, uh, he found a, a, a box in there. And, uh, and, and he found when he, when he uh, uh, also there was several dozen eggs in there. And so he, he, didn't know what it was all about. So he opened the box up. And in that box was $3,000 in that box. My wife has been holding out on me. So she came home and she, she said, I got in her closet and I found a box with money in it and I found some eggs in there. And, and she said, uh, oh, I wish you hadn't have done that. I didn't want you to know that. And he said, yeah, what's it all about? And she said, well, honey, she said, through the years, as long as you've been preaching, every time you preached a sermon, I put an egg in there. And he said, well, there's 11 eggs in there. That's all there is. So I've only preached 11 bad sermons for all these many years I've been preaching. He said, but what's the $3,000 from? Oh, she said, every time I got a dozen, I sold them. <laughs> uh, that, would, that would tear a preacher up. <laughs> uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, very familiar story. And we're going to read here a few verses of this, actually seven verses. And then, like I said, keep your Bible handy because we're going we're to go to some other scriptures tonight as well. If you're physically able, would you stand in honor of God's word as, as I read uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bond. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow 
thee, I'll go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbor, empty, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out, pour into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, shut the door upon her, upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me out a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou on thy children of the rest. Father, bless our time in your word tonight. Lord, would you again speak to our hearts as only you can. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, how many of you ever did this? How many have ever come home and went into the kitchen and opened up the refrigerator door and looked inside and said, Hey, man, don't we have anything to eat in this house? I don't see anything in here. Have you been to the grocery? Or goes over to the cabinet doors and opens up the cabinet doors and looks in the cabinet doors and said, uh, Hey, what's going on? Don't, don't we have anything a good to eat? Is there not anything here in this house to eat? Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Yes, I am. How many of you have done that? Amen. <laughs> I my hand's up. Now, was the refrigerator empty? Usually not. Was the cabinets any empty? Most of the time, no. Here's what we really meant. I don't see what I want. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff in there. But we have something in mind, and we just scorn by what we don't see. Amen? Now, follow me now, because here's what the title of this sermon is. What do you have? What do you have? Isn't it amazing how negative we can be when it comes to some time of overlooking God's blessings and what we do have, but sometimes major on what we don't have. Now, that's a uh, advertisers and society, they prey upon that in the sense that they want you discontented and, and realize, hey, you don't have this, you don't have that, so you need to get this, you need to get that. And as a result, we forget how blessed we are. Can I tell you something? As Americans, thank God for our country, thank God for the freedoms we've had. Amen. But you know what? Just to be honest with you, most Americans fail to recognize just how good we do have it. Yes. How blessed we are. You know, uh, hey, we have more food usually thrown away in our trash than the rest of the world has to eat. Or at least 80% of the world, I'm told, has to eat. And and, and we, we've been blessed beyond measure in the sense... I'll give you an illustration. We have a Cambodian boy who came to our church. He actually, uh, my, my oldest daughter, and now he's my son-in-law, but he was one of our teenagers at the time, was uh, in high school there. And they met Boon Tim in high school and invited him to church. And, and so Boon Tim started coming to our church. And my daughter and my son-in-law now, they said when he came in the lunchroom, at the, at the high school for the first time. What he had done, he had come from Cambodia and he had come through a refugee camp in Laos and he had been in that refugee check camp for quite some time. And when he walked into the lunchroom, he just stood there and he just looked. And he really didn't know what to do. And, and, and he said to uh, uh, Jason, he said, uh, 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 what are we supposed to do here? And he said, get lunch. Well, they had a sandwich line, a hot lunch line. They had a pizza bar and they had a salad bar. And he said, well, how much? And he said, whatever you want. And they said they watched him and he went over here and he went to the pizza line and he got a piece of pizza and, and then he got a sandwich and then he went to the salad bar and just started piling it all on his tray. 
And he said, I have never seen so much food in my life. I have never seen so much food. And you mean you have this much food every day? He could not. We took him. We took him on a ski trip. He had never seen snow in his life. And we got there, and we told everybody, take your lunch, or we'll, we'll buy a lunch when we get there. You know, they'll have a place where you can buy your lunch. And when lunch comes, we'll all eat together. So we went into what they, the little lodge like place they had and got together to have lunch. Some brought it, others went over, bought pizza and stuff they had there. Well, we had brought food for Boone Ken, and, and so as a result, uh, he had a lunch there, and we all was sat down and we were just talking. And all of a sudden, the young lady sitting across from me, she said, Brother Decker, you gotta go get Boone Ken. I said, why, what's he doing? She said, turn around and look. There was a group that had been behind us at a, a bunch of tables, and they had got up and left. And when they got up and left, they left food. Boone Tin was over there gathering it up, and he was eating it. And I said, Boone Tin, we have food. You come over and eat our food. He said, you know, throw away. You can't, can't throw away food. People, I know people dying should have thrown this food away. I could never convince him that it was okay to come over there. You see why? Because, hey, he realized how blessed we were. He saw the blessings. He had been on the other side of that. I'm glad I can tell you that I got to leave Boone in the Lord eventually. And, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share it and I'll give him in the message. But he came to me at a team meeting and he said to me, how Boone can you get got broken understanding of English and I got to be able to get through to him and the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart and I said Boon Tin how did you get to America? He said Boon Tin big airplane. I said Boon Tin did you what did you have to have to get on that airplane? And he said oh Boon Tin had to have a ticket. I said did you buy it? Oh he said Boon Tin I didn't buy it. I can't buy the ticket. I said how, how, how did you get the ticket? Oh somebody for the boom tent and give it to him so I can go to America. And I said, Boom Tent, somebody bought you a ticket to heaven, and his name's Jesus. And he paid for it for you because you couldn't pay for it because you're a sinner. And because of your sin, you could not get to heaven. But Jesus loved you and died for you on the cross. And he paid for your ticket. All you gotta do is accept it like you did that ticket. Oh, Boone Tim said, I will take it. <laughs> and he fell down on his knees right there and began to pray in Cambodia. Of course, I had no idea what he was saying. <laughs> and I said to him, Boone Tim, what, what did you just, he said, oh, I asked God, I will take it, Boone Tim, take ticket so I can get to heaven. I want Jesus. <laughs> and so I talked with him a little further, explained the scriptures. We came, well, we was in a little side room. We came out, and there was a platform there, and all our people were out there. And old Boone Tim was so excited. He walked out there, and he said, Hey, Boone Tim just got ticket to heaven. Jesus, give it for him. <laughs> Amen. But listen, we, we've been blessed. We've been blessed. And we best not forget what we have. You see, it's easy to say what I don't have. How much and how many times do we do inventory on what we do? You see, here's a lady. This lady, she goes to the Bible, tells to Elisha, and she says, My husband's dead, and I, I'm in debt. I'm in so much debt that the creditors are coming, and they're going to take my two boys as bond servants because they could do that back then. And, in other words, they was going to use those boys to work that debt off as bond servants. And they're coming, and she had nobody else. It was just her then, and her sons were very vital to her and her existence. And Elisha in verse 2 said this. Uh, he said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? Here, here, let me put it in our language today. What do you have, ma'am? What do you have in the house? And you notice her response? What's the first half of her response? He said, she said to him, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. But then she remembered. 
Well, wait a minute. I have not anything in the house. Well, except I do have a pot of oil. And you notice what Elisha said? Go borrow some empty pot. Every vessel you can get, go borrow. You see, here was the plan. She had focused on what she did not have. She had focused on the part that, hey, she still had two boys, but she was about to lose those boys uh, into uh, uh, bond, uh, being bond slaves, and so she was concerned. But the only problem, here's what Elisha was saying to her. It's not that you don't have anything in the house, but what you do have, you're fixed to use. Use what you have. Take advantage of what you have. Hey, listen, what we have, if we'll put into the hands of God, we'll be blessed and go further than we can ever imagine. Here's what he's telling her. Ma'am, you're going to use that, that one pot of oil, and you're going to shut yourself up in a room with your boys. Now, use your boys. You still got them. They're in the house. And you get those vessels from your neighbors, and then you'll have your sons bring you those vessels. You'll take that pot of oil, and every time an empty vessel is put down, you use that same pot and refill it. Can you imagine the excitement? She fills one pot and thinks, good night, that's, that's all of it. And she looks over, and she picks it up, and she fills up another vessel. And she fills up another vessel. And this oil seems to be endless until she says, bring me another vessel. And her son says, no, no, there is none. They're all gone. And then the Bible says this. The oil said. She had filled up everything she had. And so, hey, can I tell you something? I believe she had had ten more vessels. I believe she had filled up ten more vessels. I believe whatever she had, that was God was just going to bless it and fill it up. But she had enough that she could pay off her debt. And they could even live on it. And so here Elisha was saying to her, it's easy to look around and say, I don't have anything in this house. Well, yes, you do. And what you have with it, here's what you need to do. Give it to God. Amen. Use it in the way God wants you to use it. Use it, and I'll bless it. I'll make it go further. I, I, I've been saying this, uh, in, I guess, about every message. But listen, God has a way of taking those things that we place in his hands and multiplying it. And multiplying it. He can do that. He can do that. So here's my question to you tonight. First of all, let's don't major on what we don't have. What are you doing with what you do have? Have you ever heard somebody say this? Man, if I hit the lottery... I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And in this big one they just had, did you know what? You are probably you were probably a thousand more times likely to get hit by lightning than you were to win that. But everybody makes big plans with what they don't have. But the question is, what are we doing with what we do have? That's it right there. This lady, hey, what she did not have was not going to help her. But she did use what she did have. And God blessed it, you see. And so if we'll use what we have, you know what God just very well may do? And that's multiply in such a way that, hey, we know it had to be God. She knew that it had to be God doing this. Nobody else could have done that. God was the only way. Did you know there's times when we need to just learn to trust him and depend upon him? And can I say this honestly? Sometimes the Lord has to allow us to get in a place that's kind of difficult like this lady in order that you and I can learn to trust him. Sometimes we can say, why? But let me tell you something. Paul, Paul explained that when he said we have this treasure in earth and vessel. And why? So that it might redound unto the glory of God. And so things happen sometimes to get our attention and say, don't worry about what you don't have. Use what you do have. Use what. You know what a good steward does? He uses what he does have. That's what he does. And he uses it in such a way that it honors God and he allows God to have the use of it. And so we see the first question and the first thing we need to do is use what we have. Now turn to Mark 6.
I told you we are going to go to some passages this year. Go to Mark 6. And in Mark chapter number 6, some very familiar stories here. You, you know these accounts. In Mark chapter 6, and in, in verse number, it starts up in verse number uh, uh, 33, but I want you to go to verse number 37. Verse number 37. And it says, uh, when the, all the crowd is gathered, the 5,000 are there, and, and they need to be fed. And the Bible says in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, Jesus speaking, give you them to eat. He's speaking to his disciples. And they say unto him, shall we throw them about 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And he saith unto them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they say five loaves and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were all filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. We know they tell us that there could have been twenty to 25,000 because it was 5,000 men. And so we find that here's the whole point here. It's not only use what we have, but do what we're told with what we have. In other words, here you, you know the story. There was a the little lad. He had five loaves, two fishes. What, what was the disciples doing? They were, they, were, they were panicking because the Lord said, we got to feed them. And they said, Lord, in one of the other towns, Lord, we only have 200 penny worth. What's 200 penny worth of bread? That's not enough to feed these people. Lord, you said feed them. How are we going to feed them? And Andrew says, well, there's a little lad here, and he has five loaves and two fishes. And I can see the other disciples saying, I mean, 200 penny worth of bread might be more than the five loaves and two fishes. I mean, what is that? That's a little kid's lunch. And by the way, five loaves are not loaves of bread like we have. They were probably little cake-like loaves that would be eaten individually. And so uh, I kind of, I used to say, I, I thought it was kind of like what my mom used to make those, those uh, uh, cornbread whole cakes, you know. But it was bread. And, and I think it was probably the little boy's lunch, Steve. And two, and it's emphasized, small fishes. You know, the skeptics say this. Well, it was just a big loaves of bread, and it was some real big fish. Uh, the little lad was carrying it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. We, I know my friend, I'll take that back. I know so. <laughs> Amen. I know. Hey, it was a miracle of God. But here was the key. Jesus said, you do what I tell you. God's five loaves and two fishes. But if you'll just do with it as I say, I'll show you what I can do. You see, the key was listening to him. They couldn't do it. The disciples couldn't do it. But, and that little lad, he couldn't have fed them on his own. But the key was, he yielded what he had, the lad did. And he yielded to the Lord to use it in the way he wanted to use it. And here's what the Lord said. Before they ever saw him, he said, go out there and sell them down in companies of 50. Get them ready to eat. In other words, I can sell them as they're going. Well, what are we going to feed them? What's going on? Why are we setting them down to eat? We don't have any food. <laughs> hey, they were about to see a miracle of God take place. And the Lord already knew what he was going to do because he is God. Amen. I shared with you the other night about George Mueller. George Mueller, if you ever, how many, anybody ever read the biography of George? I love to read it. I read it. I just read, I just read it again just a couple of weeks ago, and I found something new in there that I had not seen before. But I love it because George Mueller had all these orphans, and and one day there came a time and they had no food. They had no food. And that morning, they got up and they said that he told them all, sit at the table, let's get at the table, we're going to pray and thank the Lord for the food. 
And they said, Mr. Mueller, what food? We don't have any food. And he said, the Lord will provide. He'll provide. He always does. And about that time, a knock came at the door. And, a, and the baker in town, I believe it was a baker there, and he said, Mr. Mueller, uh, I was awakened by the Lord this morning early, and I've baked way more bread than I need, and I figured you all could use some bread over here. And he had bread for them to eat. And then just shortly after that, a knock came at the door, and there stood the messenger. He said, Mr. Mueller, my truck's broke down out right here. And he said, it's going to take some time to get it fixed. And all this milk I got rolling on here is going to spoil. And so, could you use some milk so it's not wasted? And they ate that. On another time, he set the kids down at the table. That was just like that. And they said, Mr. Mueller, what are we going to eat today? He said, children, the Lord will provide. A knock came at the door. He went and opened the door, and when he did, he was surprised. There standing in the doorway was one of his number one adversaries in that room. He had fought against that orphanage. He had fought against Mr. Mueller, and he was standing there, and he had, a, had groceries, bags, a box of groceries set in his feet. He had bags of groceries in his arm. And he said, and Mr. Mueller before he, Mr. Mueller could say anything. He said, now don't get the wrong idea. I didn't bring this stuff. I wouldn't bring this stuff to you, but I was giving it, and somebody said this, since I was coming this way, drop it off. So I'm just dropping this stuff off. Don't think it's me, because I still haven't changed my mind about you or your work. And Mr. Mueller just started, well, glory to God, praise the Lord. And that guy looked at him and said, what in the world? You lost your mind? What in the world are you praising the Lord about? He said, I'm just standing here thinking how we needed food. And God sent us food and even used the devil to deliver it to us. <laughs> you know what? Five loaves and two small fishes fed possibly 20, 25,000 people and took up 12 baskets. Now, in my own mind, I think that little boy went home with a lot more than he came. Amen. We don't know who exactly got all the baskets, but I kind of feel like he probably went home and, and man was more than he came with. Because that's who our God is and what he does. And so, hey, it's not only use what we have. We use what we have the way we're told to use it. And we see that God blessed it because of that. Jesus, if we'll allow him we were, uh, we were in a missions conference up at Grace several years ago. We had uh, uh, a man, my brother Joe Prickett, was on staff at that time. He had a little girl, at him, and she wasn't, I don't know how old she was at the time. She wasn't very old. And she had been saving her money up for a uh, American Girl doll. Is that what they're called? Those uh, dolls? You know, okay, I don't see his. And so she wanted to buy one, and her mom and dad said, well, if you want to, just have to save your money up. And she she was getting money toward that. And, and uh, we had had a missionary that was going to one of the uh, Hispanic, uh, Hispanic countries. And he somehow, I, I've forgotten all that happened, but he mentioned something about needing one of those Bibles that had English and Spanish in it, side by side, a King James Bible. And so... She went to her daddy and she said, Daddy, I want to buy that missionary one of those Bibles. I'm going to get one. And he said, Abby, they're, they're quite expensive, honey. And she said, that's okay, Daddy. He said, I've got my doll money, and it's more important that people get saved than me have a baby doll. And he said, so, Daddy, I'm going to do that. And he said, I have your money. But you understand, if you do that, you won't be able to So they went out and they bought the Bible for the mission. And so he was so excited he did that missionary that Bible and that, and that Bible. He just he took it and boy, she just, you know, that, that was a great thing. And she hadn't really said anything to anybody as far as the American uh, American 
American baby doll, whatever it's called, American girl, baby doll. And you know, right after she gave that Bible, I can't remember the whole story exactly how it played out, but she got a call from somebody. I don't know if it was a relative or whatever, but they said, you've got your American girl, baby doll. You see, God blessed in such a way that this little girl, just a small girl, because God has passed on her heart, uses what she has. God can turn around and work in somebody else's life and say, do this. And boy, I tell you what, that little gal, she gave that testimony. God, the next time we had a testimony, I gave my doll money to God to buy a Bible for a missionary. You know what? That'll stay with her the rest of her life. Do what we're told with what we have. Now go with me, if you will, over to the book of Luke, chapter 5. Luke, chapter 5. Luke, chapter 5. And look at verse number 4. Luke, chapter 5, verse number 4. Now Jesus has entered into the ship. He's, he's thrust out a little from the land, and he's using the ship to teach the people in. Now, understand this. There's a purpose for that. You know why? Because when he pushed out a little bit from the shore, that land where he was at was kind of bold coming down into that shore of, the, of that sea. And, and, and so as a result, it acted like a natural amphitheater and then when you get out on water, you know what water does? It reflects sound. And so his voice could actually be increased and, and, and would, was able for everybody to hear. If you've ever been out on water, you better be careful what you say on one side of a lake <laughs> if there's somebody you're talking about on the other side of the lake. Because unless there's some wind going on and if it's still, you'd be surprised what could be heard from one side of the lake to the other because that sound carries across the water. Just, just a warning. <laughs> and so, but he's using that. Now watch what happens. Watch what happens. In verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, when he was done teaching the people, he said to the son, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. Simon answered and said, Now, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Now, watch this. Here they had been out fishing all night long. But there's a difference this time. Number one difference is Jesus is in the boat. Amen? Number two, he's the one telling them where to go. In other words, he said, launch out into the deep. You're not going to catch fish sitting on the bank. He said, you got to go to where the fish are, so launch out the deep. Here's the reply of Simon Peter. Lord, we've been out all night long. We haven't caught fish. But, nevertheless, because you said it, we'll do it. We'll do it. And when they dropped the nets down, where Jesus said, when Jesus said, there was a huge pool of fish there. wonder how they got there. They'd fished all night long. And they're professional fishermen. And they called them. One of the hardest things for a professional fisherman to do is to say, I caught nothing. And they caught nothing. But Jesus said, go ahead and let you. I can hear Peter's skepticism. There's nothing there. But you know what Jesus had done? He'd call, he, he'd put school in session. Amen? By the way, do y'all know why fish are so smart? Because they stay in school all their life. <laughs> Oh, I should have threw that in there, but anyway. There's this school of fish. Wonder how they got there. I know exactly how they got there. The Creator put them there. Did you know what? 
The only part of creation that God has any trouble with, you know who it is? Man. Every other part of creation obeys it. The winds obey. The seas obey. The animals obey. It's just the rebellious heart of man. And so those fish were right there. He, they dropped those, those nets that they've been using. Those nets that they had all along. What do you have, Peter? You got a net? Well, it's for fishing. Drop them down there, and I'll show you what it'll do. Here's the difference, though. They did it where the Lord said do it. A little later on, you remember, they, they, Jesus had died, and, and, and Peter and the others were together, and they said, I go fishing, Peter did. And they said, we go with you. Discouraged, downhearted. But they get out there, and Jesus is on the shore, and he says, uh, children have you in me. And they say, no. And he said, let down your net on the right side of the boat. And it filled the net up. 153 cases. I believe that's what it was. Did you notice what he said, though? He didn't say left side of the boat. He didn't say anywhere you want it. He said, put it on the right side of the boat. Why? That's where he had the fish left. <laughs> yeah. They hadn't called them. They weren't there before. Now they're there. If they had said, hey, we don't want to fish on the right side. We've already been through there. I've written it on it. They wouldn't have got paid. But if they'll do what he says, if they go where he says, that's what makes it. <coughs> that's where God has a Do you understand? If we go where God says, that's where we'll find God. Can I tell you something? If God calls a person to the missionary, or be a missionary to the mission field, that's where they're going to find the blessings. Years ago, I heard this say, where God guides, he provides. Where he leads, he feeds. You see, the main thing is, we just got to go where God says go. And use what we have for the glory of God, but use it where God wants us to use it. God has a purpose for every one of us, and he has a plan for us. And he wants to use our abilities, and he wants to use our talents. He actually has a place for us to go. For you right now, you're right here at Gateway Baptist Church. And God says, hey, as a member of Gateway Baptist Church, use what you have. Where I placed you at. So it can be used and multiplied in a great way. You know what? Hey, God wants to use what we have. You know, he just like he used the lad and his fishes to feed a multitude. Do you know we live in a world around us that needs the bread of life? And he wants to use us to carry that bread of life to them. And he wants us to do that. And so he can bless. And so, hey, we can see souls saved. Did you know God wants to use every one of us so that we can become fishers of men like he did with, with Peter and, and the others. And, and, and what we need to do is, hey, Lord, where do you want me to go? Where do I need to put down the net? I'll never forget one night. And Scott's wife pastor, and we got a card on a on a young woman, a single mom. She had two little, very rambunctious boys. As a matter of fact, we were told that these little boys, before we ever went, they were very, very active little boys. Very, very bad. So we felt like we needed to go visit this lady, and I, I had a teenage young man that was going with us that night, and I came to him and I said, "Hey, I I want you to." Go with us. To make, I feel like the Lord wants us to go to this house, and, and, but I want you to go with us. And he looked at me and said, well, you and Miss Denise are going. You I said, yeah, we have a purpose. I said, you're going to play cowboys and Indians or whatever them little boys want so we can talk to Mama. I said, God's impressed the fact that I'm going to, you need to go with us. So we got there, and when we got there, she wasn't home, and I was a bit disappointed because I just, Felt like the Lord was leading us. And so we were walking back to the car from the trailer door, and she pulled up. She'd been to the grocery store. So we helped her carry the groceries in the house. And, and man, them little guys, they were very busy and very active. And so we sat down, and we started trying to, to, to talk to Mom. And, and I looked over at Jeff, and I said, and I said, you know, play with them little boys. I was wanting him to keep them busy. And, and so she was trying to talk, and 
They was climbing up over her head and over the couch, and they was on my shoulders, and they was everywhere, you know. And so Jeff got got up, and he said, hey, boys, he said, how, how about, let's, uh, and so he got over here on one side of the, the house there, on the room, big room, wherever it's at, and, and man, he just started playing with them, and had them over there, and they was crawling over him, and, and they was climbing on him, and uh, trying to uh, get him down on the floor and choke him and all that stuff, you know. And I could glance while I was trying to talk to this lady. And then I looked over and I saw Jeff doing this stuff. I thought, man, he's praying. And in a little while, we got to talking to Mom. And I got her Bible out. I started witnessing to her. The little boy climbed up on the back of he fell asleep. And the other little boy crawled under the coffee table. And he fell asleep. And Jeff said, oh, he's still praying. <laughs> Witness to the mom. We got down on our knees at her couch. And she accepted Christ as her Savior. And the moment we got done kneeling and praying, the little boys came to my house like a snack dog. They woke up. And man, they left right, they, they, they started right back in where they left off. We got out in the car. I said to Jeff, Jeff, what, what were you doing over there? Were you praying? He said, yeah, I was out of everything to do with them. And he said, man, he said, I, my neck was about broke where they'd been hanging on me and everything. And he said, you said, you should always pray, you know. And he said, so I just started praying, Lord, uh, you're going to have to control them. I can't control them. And their mama needs to be saved. And, so, and he said, they just fell asleep. <laughs> Jeff, God must have wanted you to come here tonight. I do believe that he led you to come here. Because his hand is all over. Sunday school class. Can I tell you something? Be willing to teach a Sunday school class. That's where you'll find the blessings at. Because if God's leading you there, He's going he's to bless you when you're obedient and do what He wants you to do. What, whatever it is, and wherever He wants you to go, just say, You're my Lord. What do you want me to do? Whatever. But you see, I don't know that I can do that. Give what you have to the Lord. Use it how he wants you to use it, where he wants to use it, and God will take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest. One more. One more. 1 Samuel 17. Most of you know what that is without even turning there. 1 Samuel 17. David and Goliath. Amen? 1 Samuel 17 and we find that David there is going against, getting ready to go against Goliath. And in uh, 1 Samuel 17, and let's see here, verse number, I think it'd be about around verse 30, uh, verse 38, I believe. Uh, and verse 38 of, uh, of 1 Samuel 17. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in the scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to Goliath. You know what? Here's what we got to do too. Use what we have with faith in the Lord. David said, it's not my armor. It's your armor, King Saul. I haven't proven it. I can't use that. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I do have. I have this sling. I have this sling. I've used this sling. And I've proven this sling. And, and I'm going to tell you something. It may be just a sling. And, and I may 
pick up five little smooth stones out of a brook to put in that sling. But I'm not dependent on the sling. I'm not going to read all of it, but I think most of you can understand. Over and over again, David told Goliath, my God will deliver you into my hand. This day, you're going to die. My Lord is going to feed you to the fowls of the air. I come to you in the name of the Lord of the host of the armies of Israel. You know where David's faith was at? He took what he had and said, God, it's yours, and I believe you can give me the victory over Goliath. He gave his sling to God that day and depended by faith that God would defeat Goliath for him. And that day, as he, I love it, because oh, Goliath starts out. And you know, he's a big guy. So he kind of, I, I'd say when he walked, as a, you know, somewhere between nine, ten feet tall, big old, big old body, big old feet, uh, that he lumbered when he walked, if you understand what I mean. I mean, he wasn't a runner. He was just, had big steps and he walked. And he started toward David. You know, I come out, boom, boom, as he's walking. You see little David, what he does, he starts running. That's what it says. He ran toward him. You know why? Hey, because he knew his God was able to defeat Goliath. And I don't think he had any thought in his mind about being defeated by Goliath. He was trusting his God. He began to take that sling and wind that sling up with that little old stone in it. And that stone, but hey, the stone didn't kill him. No, God did. That stone hit him in the forehead. Now let me go outside and let me get something a little bigger than stone. I, let's say let me get a baseball. If I take a baseball and I haul back and I throw it and I hit you right here with that baseball, there's a good chance you're going to go backwards from the impact of the ball hitting you and knock you back. He just had a little stone. And it went into the glass forehead. Which way does it say the glass fell? He fell forward. I love what my son always said. Rock get him here, and God get him back here. Listen, here's the thing. He used what he had. He used what he had. Let's say, anything we got takes faith to please God. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. And as a result, we need to do it by faith. No matter how small it is, no matter what ability, no matter materially what we have, it, it's not the size, it's whether or not we're willing to use it for the glory of God. It's whether or not we're willing to put ourselves in a place where God can use us and, and bless and multiply. It, it's not how much you have, it's what are you doing with what you have. But I don't have, no, 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 no. What do you have? You know what? If I don't have a million dollars, God doesn't expect me to give a million dollars. If I don't have a hundred dollars, God doesn't expect me to give a hundred dollars. If I got two dollars, God says, what are you going to do with two dollars? I'm not accountable for what I don't have, but I am accountable for what I do have because he gave it. Can I tell you something? I'm accountable. That's not just talking about money. That's talking about everything I have. I'm accountable for how I use everything I have. I mean, you know how that man's sitting out there? You know, that's God's man. I'm accountable. I'm going to be a hell of accountable about how I use that man. Now, everything that I have, I only have it because of God. And we need to be willing to say, God, Whatever I got, I'm going to use it. I'm not going to major on what I don't have. But Lord, I'm going to use what I do have. Use what we have now, not later on. You know, a lot of times people say, well, when I get this and I get that, then I'll do that. No, 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 no. Do with what you have. God's 
bless. And he may just give you more if you're a good steward of what you already have. Use what we have now, not later when we get this or that. And use it when we're told and where we're told. What's a good steward? A good steward is using what he has in such a way that it's blessed. Not only do we benefit, but I think, you know something about this too? Every time that person involved in that was not the only one. From the lady, it was her son. It was the creditors. They all benefited. And, and, then, we, and then we saw the feeding of the 5,000. <laughs> there was 27,000 people that benefited because one of the little boys said, here's what I have. We looked and saw all the fish that was taken in the nets. That benefited not only Simon Peter and his boat, but the Bible says they had to beckon to their partners to come over and make them their boats. They got in on the blessing. David, was it just him? Oh no, it was the whole nation of Israel. They benefited because David said, here's my swing, boy. Not much. I'll be the old, you can take it. Bring the life there. The key is, what will we do with what we have? What do you got tonight? I don't know, but you know you know. What are we doing? Tonight, I don't know again.